Half-Life. In the last section we discussed three types of radioactive decay. But how long does that take? Well, that depends on which radioactive isotope is undergoing decay. Here are some common isotope pairs. You probably remember that carbon comes in three different isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13, and the radioactive isotope carbon-14, which is present in very minute quantities. Well, carbon-14 is unstable, and it decays to another element called nitrogen-14. It takes about 5,730 years for half of the carbon-14 to become nitrogen-14. So therefore we call this period of time, 5,730 years, the half-life of carbon-14. Let's take a look at another example, potassium-40. Potassium-40 is an unstable isotope of potassium and it decays to argon-40. For half of the potassium-40 to decay to argon-40, it takes 1.2 billion years. So potassium-40 has a half-life of 1.2 billion years. Um, because of the differences in half-lives, we can actually use these isotopes to date different materials. Uh, the effective dating range for carbon-14 is up to 50,000 years and it's useful for dating the age of bones and other biological specimens that maybe have been around up to 50,000 years but as recent as even 20, 30, 40 years. Potassium-40 on the other hand has a half-life of 1.2 billion years so it actually can't be used for at least not effectively used for dating newer samples, but it's very effective at dating older objects like rocks. And so it's used to date objects like rocks and if there's a fossil in the rock that's more than 50,000 years old and you can't use carbon-14, you can date the age of the rock and therefore you know when the fossil was formed and approximately when the organism lived. Now you can also see that there are other elements that have radioactive isotopes with even longer half-lives and these are also effectively used to date geological specimens or really what that means is rocks. So let's take a closer look at carbon. Uh, specifically we're interested in carbon-14 and we know that this is just an isotope of carbon. All living organisms contain all three isotopes, even the radioactive isotope carbon-14. The amount of each carbon isotope in a living thing is the same as in the atmosphere. That means that the amount of carbon-14 inside the giraffe or even inside the plants is the same as the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. As carbon-14 decays, it's replaced, so the amount stays constant in living organisms. And when we say it's replaced, we mean that the giraffe eats more of the food that contains carbon-14, and the plants themselves are constantly using carbon dioxide to produce the sugars that are the food for the giraffe. So the carbon dioxide comes from the atmosphere and therefore it's got a constant amount of carbon-14, carbon-13, and carbon-12. As a result, all the living things and the atmosphere share the same amount of carbon-14. When an organism dies, it no longer takes in carbon. As a result of the carbon decay continuing without replacement, the amount of carbon-14 diminishes over time. By measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, we can date the age of dead animals. Uh, this process is called radiocarbon dating. It's useful for uh, dating the age of plants and animals that lived up to 50,000 years ago. It can be used in more recent specimens and is actually used in crime scene investigation when up some remains are found. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. 
This means that after one half life, or 5,730 years, half of the original carbon-14 only still exists in the original sample. We say that carbon has a half life of 5,730 years. So if we take a look at this chart, we'll see what that means. Uh, at time zero, let's say an organism dies, at that moment in time, uh, the percentage of carbon-14 present in the specimen is 100%, and let's say that was 10 grams total. After 5,730 years, 50% of that carbon-14 is present and the other 50% has decayed to nitrogen-14. To show that mathematically, we take the original 10 grams and divide it by 2 or multiply by a half to see that we now have 5 grams of the original carbon-14. After another half-life or another 5,730 years, we have half of this sample present, which means that we only have 25% of the original carbon-14 present. And the way we show that mathematically is we start with the original amount of carbon-14 and multiply it by two half-lives to give us 2.5 grams total. If we carry this on, we'll see that we get less and less, but it always diminishes by half for every half-life. So every half-life Every passage of 5,730 years, which is a half-life, results in half as much carbon-14 being present as in the previous sample. And we can show this mathematically simply by multiplying the original sample mass by the number of half-lives. Here's uh, thorium-235, another radioisotope, and we can see that it has a much larger, much longer uh, half-life, 14 billion years, but the pattern is the same. We can graph this type of information to get a decay curve. Pause the video for a moment and copy this graph. And what we're going to draw is a generic radioisotope decay curve, but the shape of the curve, the shape of the line on the graph is going to be the same no matter which radioisotope you're using. But just for the sake of uh, making this a little easier to understand, let's talk about carbon-14. If we look back to the previous information, we know that carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. That would be this distance on the graph. That would be one half-life. At time zero, we had 100% of the carbon-14 present. After one half-life, there was 50% of it present. And after two half-lives, 50% of 50% present, which is 25, or half of it. After another half-life, we had half of the 25% present. And after another half-life, there's only 6.25% of the original carbon-14 present in the sample. And beyond that, if we waited another half-life, uh, it would actually be a lot harder to measure how much is remaining because there'd be such a minuscule amount. So if we create a best-fit curve here, we'll see that there is a pattern. And what we've created is a radioisotope isotope decay curve. Now, if we took another isotope, uh, for example, the thorium-235, we would get the exact same graph because for every half-life, you're going to have half of your sample remaining. And this is a standard curve that shows radioisotope decay. We can use this type of a curve uh, to solve some half-life problems with radioisotopes. Let's take iodine-131, a radioisotope of the element iodine. It has a very short half-life of eight days. It's used in the treatment of cancer, and the way they use it is that they will actually inject this radioactive iodine, and it accumulates at a thyroid gland that has cancer, because thyroid glands use iodine. And as it does that, it delivers enough radiation to kill quite a few of the cancer cells. Now, you don't want any radioactive iodine hanging around in your body for a prolonged period of time. So it's actually a really good thing that it has a half-life of eight days because after eight days only half of it will remain and it'll diminish very very quickly. So let's see how that actually works out. If we have a starting sample of 20 grams, how much is going to remain after 16 days? Well 16 days is two half-lives for 
iodine 131. So we would want to multiply this by a half two times for each of the half lives. To one five, so we're going to actually have five grams of the radioactive iodine present uh, in the person's body after 16 days. And the, and the rest of it will have changed. Try another one. You can use this for any radioactive isotope. Let's say you start with 64 grams of a radioactive isotope and you want to know how much is left after three half-lives. Well, 64 grams times one half-life times the second half-life times the third half-life. Geologists can find out the age of a rock by comparing the amount of potassium-40 to the amount of argon-40, its daughter isotope, in a sealed off gas pocket of rock. So when rock forms, it's a molten material and the amount of potassium-40 it has is pretty constant. But as it cools, uh, the potassium-40 might get sealed off in a little air pocket and it begins to decay. And as it decays, it decays into the gas argon-40. A geologist can find out the age of a rock by comparing the amount of potassium-40 to the amount of argon-40 in this sealed off gas pocket. Okay, so let's say our geologist had picked up a rock and it had air pockets in it or pockets of gas. He took it back to the lab and he used some special equipment and was able to determine a ratio of argon 40 to potassium 40 being seven times the amount of argon for every unit of potassium 40. That would tell him that the number of half-lives that had elapsed was three half-lives and that would be the equivalent of 3.9 billion years. So just knowing this information and having a half-life curve uh, allows you to work backwards. So try some of the problems in the book. Uh, there's some nice practice problems on page 306 and then uh, try also some of the problems assigned out of the workbook.